Okay. I'm Marianne Talbot. Um, I'm the Director of Studies in Philosophy. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm the Director of Studies in Philosophy at uh, this department, and I've been at Oxford University for 35 years. I can't believe that. It's amazing how quick it goes. Um, can you hear me at the back even when I'm not talking at the microphone? Good. Okay. Excellent. Um, I've been told that this is the department's 140th year of operation, that I ought to say something about it. No doubt everybody else will too, but I've got a special something. That was it. <laughs> right. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about philosophical conundrums. Um, and basically, that, I did that because it allows me to talk about anything I want to talk about, um, because philosophy is dealing with conundrums, it's dealing with puzzles, it's asking ourselves, um, what do we think about this? If you think about um, thinking, thinking is what human beings do, it's what makes us different. Aristotle thought that we were the only rational animal. So, somebody, is anyone here a zoologist? A literature person? Okay, a biologist? A physicist? Okay, we've got all sorts of things here. Whatever you think about, as a philosopher, I think about your thinking about it. Um, so I stand back from any thinking that we do in order to think about that thinking. I want to know what thinking is. I want to know what concepts you use. For example, if you're a physicist, you, you um, use concepts like quantum mechanics. Well, what does that mean? What's involved in quantum mechanics? What is entanglement, for example? Literature. Um, what is meaning? Um, you can't, um, what is a novel? Is a novel um, what is contained between the pages of one book? Well, obviously not, because here's another one. Um, is it contained between the pages of any book? Well, not necessarily these days, because it might be an e-book or something like that. So, so whatever you think about as a human being, a philosopher thinks about your thinking about it. And we also think about thinking generally. What is a thought? What is a belief? Things like that. So, anyway, I'm not going to talk. I'm going to ask you to do some thinking. So, for example, truth. That's something you talk about quite a lot. Just lately, you've probably thought about it a bit more often than you may have done, because people have been talking about fake news, that truth doesn't matter, um, there are alternative facts. Um, or so they tell me there are alternative facts, not just alternative perspectives on the facts, on the facts, but alternative facts. Um, so a philosopher wants to know, well, what is truth? Um, and the library up here is, is, has many books on truth, and the library down the road, the Bodleian, has even more. Um, but let's see what we can do in this room. What do you think truth is? I'm supposed to have a white board here. And here it is. Okay, what is truth? I'm giving you a little time to think about it. Is anyone prepared to have a give it a go? A representation of events as they happen. Representation of events as they <coughs> happen. Lovely. Thank you. Actuality. Perception. Perception. Somebody said actuality. Evidence. I spent that the French way, whoever said actuality. <laughs> Verifiable. Just to show off. Verifiable. Uh, I missed one. Evidence. Evidence. Uh, these are one word answers. Um, and do you really want to say truth is evidence? No. Whoever truth, said evidence? Truth must be subject to evidential Did you say evidence? I, I said evidence. Okay, go on. So you're allowed to change it. Say it again. Evidential um, verification. Just, uh, ver verification. Oh. Uh, well, we've got verifiable. So, so, okay, let's, let's oh, just leave it there. Any yeah. other ideas? Right at the back. Possibly. 
neutral. Yeah. Okay. And right at the back. A fact capable of only one interpretation. I can read this, I know you can't, but it's... Uh, okay, I'm going to take one more. What, um, Could I withdraw mine, please? <laughs> <laughs> the verifiable. That's not verifiable. So the veritas means truth. I'm saying truth is truth, so I withdraw that, please. Okay, somebody said something else. What, we're going to take one more. You, sir, at the back. Correspondence with reality. Correspondence with reality. Okay, lovely. We've got lots. Of, that, that's really good. That's what I like to see. Lots of different ideas. But let's, let's um, subject them to a bit of um, critical reasoning. And let's pull them apart a bit. Okay, the first one says the representation of events as they happen. Um, so there are no truths about the future. Who was it said that? No truths about the future? Not that we know, because we are interpreting truth. And as okay. people, as humans, we are interpreting truth. And so we, are, we can't project. You don't think it's true now that the sun will rise tomorrow? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. It's, it's okay, but there are different sorts of truth. I mean, that's already interesting, isn't it? There's a necessary type of truth, and there's a not necessary type of truth. So, for example, uh, would you agree that it's true I'm wearing jeans? Well, let's start. <laughs> okay, um, but it's not necessarily true, is it? Because I might have put on a skirt on this morning. Um, so that's a contingent truth that Marianne's wearing jeans. Um, and um, the sun's rising tomorrow. If it's true that the sun will rise tomorrow, that's not a necessary truth either, is it? But it's a darn sight more necessary than, than that I'm wearing jeans, um, I hope. <laughs> um, but uh, you might think now that it possible that it's true now that the sun will rise tomorrow. We're all going to act as if it'll rise tomorrow, aren't we? I mean, we're not going to go home and make plans for the not rising of the sun tomorrow morning. Um, what is a necessary truth? Can anyone think of one? The smaller of a triangle will have three sides. But a triangle's having three sides is a necessary truth, as is a bachelor's Even being smaller. an unmarried man. Yeah. Um, so there are mathematical truths tend to be necessary truths, um, but there are other necessary truths. There are truths like, for example, I'm female. Is it necessarily the case that I'm female? Could I have been male? Could you have been whatever you're not? Um, In the present climate, definitely. Okay, could you have been a hippopotamus? No. You say that? No. <laughs> If you were what? If, well, I, if I believed in transubstantiation, I could. That would make you a hypotomous. There are hundreds of people here. I could have been in a previous life. Mm. Okay, so you think the fact that you're a human being is, is a contingent fact about you, not a necessary fact. Yes. You could have been a hippopotamus. Okay, but you think, who, was it you? Yes. Think it's a necessary truth that, that you're a human can being. Can you define what you mean by necessary? Yes, uh, I can. A necessary truth is a truth, something that's true in every possible world. That may not help because you'll want to know what a possible world is. And a possible world is a, is a world, this is the actual world, uh, and the possible worlds exist um, in logical space. They don't exist in physical space, but they exist in logical space. Um, and we access them every time we go in for counterfactual thinking. So every time we think something like, had the Germans won the war, we would be talking German, we would be speaking German. That's, the Germans didn't win the war, so that's a counterfactual truth, if indeed it is a truth. Um, and in order to determine the truth of it, we spin the possible worlds. We've got to imagine 
what it's like in other possible worlds. Okay, there, that's a little run through the truth. There. Okay, the representation of events as they happen. So that took us into necessary and contingent truth. It took us into whether there's any truths about the future, truths now about the future. Okay, a fact capable of only one interpretation. Ooh, that's a nice one. Okay, um, difficult to know what to say about that. But, um, if you were watching the television with your five-year-old granddaughter, grandson, whatever, um, and your 20-year-old niece, do you think that you're all, the three of you, watching the same things? Okay, would you get from the things that you're watching the same? No, no. no you wouldn't, would you? What about this? Oops. I'm going to screw this up, as I always do. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> oh, well, there you are. Yeah, it's better than I thought. Okay, that's a rabbit. Does anyone think it's a duck? <laughs> you think it's duck? Okay. So there's a fact, what I've drawn on the whiteboard, but it's capable of more than one interpretation, isn't it? And we're all familiar with the Necker cube and, and all the other things that, that can be interpreted in different ways. The, exactly the same phenomenon. Okay, but now we ask, well, what do we mean by a fact? But then it's not a truth. Because that is not a true representation of a rabbit. So it's oh. not a truth. Because it's <laughs> <laughs> Everyone recognised it immediately. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a truth. Um, it's not a truth. Well, how do you know? Because we don't yet know what truth is. Okay, that's, that's what we're asking here. Um, we, we've dealt with representations as they happen. Fact capable of only one interpretation. I hope you'll agree that... Um, Okay, what you're saying is that that drawing wasn't a truth. No, okay. But arguably, it was a fact. It was a fact, wasn't it, that Marianne drew something on the board? It's, it's, the fact is qualified by one that is only capable of one interpretation. So as that isn't capable of only one interpretation, it's a fact, so it can't be a fact, but a truth. can't be a fact, or it can't be it a can't truth. Be truth. Fact of it, right. Which is capable of I don't. I think truth is one thing, and interpretation is another. And this is why I think that. Before you turn it over, isn't the truth? No, I'm going to turn it over. Right. Uh, I'm in charge of the truth. You make some lines on a piece of paper. That's true. Uh, it is, uh, but I'm just going to talk about something. Um, so, okay, this is uh, Marianne is wearing stripes. Okay, is that true? Okay, what's your name? Chris. Chris. Chris believes that Marianne is wearing stripes. Two? True. Good, okay, two truths. Um, here we've got one sentence embedded within another. Okay, so there's Marianne is wearing stripes, which we agreed was true. And there's Chris believes that Marianne is wearing stripes, which is also true. Okay, could that be true whilst this was false? Yes. Yes, yes. okay, so uh, it's possible that's true and that's false. Could that be false and that true? So could it be true that I'm wearing stripes, but not true that Chris believes it? Yeah. Okay, so I forgot which way around I said it. Um, true, false. Okay, could they both be false? Yeah. yeah. And could they both be true? Yeah. Which is the actual situation. So the truth value of the embedding sentence and the embedded sentence differ independently. Do you see that? Why is that? I'll tell you why. It's because 
The fact that makes that true is a fact about me and what I'm wearing, okay? And the fact that makes that true is a truth about Christine and her beliefs, isn't it? So as what I'm wearing has nothing to do with Christine's beliefs, the truth value of those two things differs uh, independently. So we've got two things in play here. We've got um, a belief that P, so Christine's belief, P just stands in for a sentence, Marianne's wearing stripes or something like that. A belief that P and P, okay? Now, it can be true that somebody <laughs> believes P and true that P, but it can also be true that somebody <laughs> believes P and yet not true that P. Do you see what I mean? Interpretation comes in here. It does not come in here. The world is as it is quite independently of our beliefs. Or is it? That, I mean, that's another philosophical question. But usually we tend to think that the, the world is, that truths are as they are, independently of our interpretation of them. Um, whether that's true, lots of books written about that, um, but the ca fact capable of only one interpretation, that mixes the metaphysical, um, talking about facts, and the epistemological, talking about knowledge or belief. Um, so I'm going to cross that out too, I'm afraid, sorry. Um, perception. Um, okay. Are there three consecutive sevens in the decimal expansion of pi? Yes. Who said yes? No. You're just saying that. We don't know, actually, is the answer. The, uh, in the decimal expansion of pi, which is an infinite number, as far as we've got, there are no three consecutive sevens. I mean, the fact is, whether there are three consecutive sevens or not, is a fact, isn't it? If there are no three consecutive sevens in the decimal expansion of pi, then it's true that there are no three... Is that anything to do with perception? No. So I'm crossing that off too. Okay. Truth is actuality, or its correspondence with reality. I think here we're getting uh, a bit more like a philosophical definition. The correspondence theory of truth um, is a very um, well accepted theory of truth. It's not the only one. Um, the correspondence theory of truth tells us that truth, which is a property of sentences or beliefs, okay, if you think about that, nothing can be true apart from sentences, uh, sorry, beliefs and the sentences that express them. If there weren't any believers in the world, there wouldn't be any truths at all. But what makes a belief true is the world, is reality, what's out there. Okay? So, so there's a, it looks as if there's a relation between our beliefs and the world, and though that relation, or one of those relations, can be truth. Um, okay, so Correspondence is rather vague. We'd like to know a lot more about what correspondence is. Um, and of course, we'd like to know a lot more about what reality is. Um, physicists will let us into that, we hope, at some point. Um, but there are philosophical thoughts about that as well. Um, okay, truth is neutral. Well, it's neutral to this extent. Um, what I hope I've convinced you of is that truth is independent of us. Um, if truth is independent of us, it is neutral, isn't it? If there isn't, is anything non-neutral, it's our interpretation of the truth. It's the way we perceive the truth. So, if you like, um, uh, this is you, this is somebody else, this is somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, somebody else. And this is the world. Um, each person here has their own picture of the world. So everybody in this room 
has as a picture a set of beliefs about me. Um, she's got grey hair, she's wearing stripes, she's um, obviously English, you know, whatever your picture is. Um, and then there's me, okay? Um, I've got my own picture, so I'm here somewhere too. Um, Marianne's picture of the world. Um, now, what we think is that though all these are pers different perspectives on the world, on the truth, um, the truth exists and is as it is independently of all these perspectives on it. Okay, That's a very realist way of thinking about the truth. Of course, what we could do is get rid of that and say that all there is is pictures of the world. There isn't any world at all. And what makes pictures of the world true is coherence. So if I want to know whether the chairs in this room really are blue or whether it's my colour blindness playing up again, I say to Susan, are the chairs blue? And she says yes. And so this corroboration, um, there's been, I have verified <coughs> my belief by checking it with Susan's belief. So um, I, th I've got more evidence for the truth of my belief because I believe that Susan also cares about her beliefs being true, and we both think the chairs are blue. Okay, and if everyone here says the chairs are blue, that's even more evidence, etc. And so I'm determining truth without looking at the world at all, or am I? Because actually what, what I'm asking is whether we're all seeing this the same thing. But big questions there. Okay, I think... So, if there is mind-independent truth, it's neutral. If there isn't mind-independent... I'm sorry, I crossed that out just because I take myself to have dealt with it. If there isn't mind-independent truth, if the, all there is is us checking our beliefs against each other, um, does that still make it neutral? I mean, the intersubjectivity of truth then... So this is truth, truth being objective. We think of truth as objective. But if it isn't, if all it is is intersubjective, in other words, it's the agreement of all of us, um, then is it neutral? I don't know. If I'm more powerful than you, as I probably am when we're talking about philosophy, um, I can make you think what I think, can't I? Mm -hmm. I probably can. Um, uh, no, but what if, if there's no more to truth than consensus, then if I can, by bullying you, make a consensus... Okay, no, you're shaking your heads here, but what you're saying is you don't believe that there is no more to truth than consensus. I don't think you're, you're disagreeing with my saying, if there is no more to truth than consensus, then if I can bully you enough, if I can bully you into a consensus, we have truth. And that's dangerous, isn't it? Um, we won't mention that name in this room. Uh, do you mind if I leave beauty out on the, <laughs> on the ground? I mean, truth is obviously beautiful. I, I agree with you there. Truth is the most beautiful thing there is, um, I think. Okay, let's move on, because um, I wasn't just going to talk about what is truth. I'm also going to talk about what is colour. I thought we'd I'd lighten the proceeding a bit. Okay, well, what is colour? Well, we all see in truth that the seats are blue, but how do we know that we're all seeing the same truth? Good, okay. Let's, um... Where's my pen? So if I say what is colour, you, you've immediately asked the question, um, how do we know that when we say the chair is blue, chairs are blue, uh, we all experience the same thing. Actually, it's the, our experience is the evidence for saying that the chairs are blue, but um, 
Yes. Okay, how do we know that we're all saying the same thing? We don't. We don't. Okay. Well, that's, that's interesting. So, um, you, sir, what's your name? Matthew. Matthew. Matthew might see when he looks at the chairs what I see when I look at that gentleman's shirt. Stand up and show your lovely pink shirt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, when Matthew looks at the chairs, he, see, he sees that colour. Um, and what's your name? Medicare. Mary Medicare. Medicare. Uh-huh. Okay, when she looks at the search, she sees, stand up, <laughs> this purple. Okay, how, how do we know that that's not happening? We don't know that that's what's happening, do we? But there is no way of finding out. Um, what does that tell us about what colour is? Could, please, could we start by saying colour is a series of names given to light, of given wavelengths within a certain boundaries and that the names vary enormously from culture to culture because there are some in which Why we would we want to say. start by saying that? <laughs> what, what, is, what is colour? I, I did indeed say it's what names, is colour. It's names that we give. Okay, but, but you're language. starting by giving an opinion as if it's a fact. Which is a fact that we give names to certain wavelengths. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one answer um, is red. Let's give it a different one is um, anything that reflects light at 650 nanometers? But it differs from culture to culture. No. Who's what? <laughs> <laughs> if I've got red, green, colour blindness, I see red and green. I, and that's blue. nothing to do with this, because <laughs> um, the... Uh, answer to the question is red is anything that reflects light at 650 nanometers. Yep. I'm not going to believe that. Uh, no. Well, actually, I'm. Do know. I'm fairly sure about that, but I, but I might be wrong. Let's say that I'm right. Okay. So red is uh, anything that reflects light at 650 nanometers. So the top of this pen, that lady's cardigan is red because it's reflecting light. And, okay, what do we think about this? Affect. It's what? Affect. It, affect. Affect. Oh, a fact. It's a fact. Okay, so you agree with it. Okay, who else agrees with it? If you say it's true, red in English, because red in different languages doesn't necessarily mean that what is translated as red Maybe more maroon in another world. Mm. We're, we're not going to quarrel about yeah. where red yeah. shades off into other colours. We're, we're talking about red. We're talking about that. Stand up. We're talking about that colour there. <laughs> right. Shall I tell you why that isn't right? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Well, let me ask you a question. Okay, let's do a thought experiment. If there was um, a cosmic accident, this is the nice thing about being a philosopher, you don't have to worry about things like physical reality. Okay, if there was a cosmic accident and it changed the um, wavelength at which red was seen, okay, so we come in here tomorrow, exactly the same setup. What's your name? The lady in the Barbara. Barbara's here in her red cardigan again. Um, but the cardigan doesn't reflect light at 650 nanometers. It reflects light at 250 nanometers. But we continue to see it like that. Okay? So I'm pulling apart our experience of red and the wavelength of light reflected by objects that, that we correlate with red. Uh, and I'm saying, which does red go with? Are we going to say, we, so Barbara's cardigan it continues to look like that, but it doesn't any longer affect light at 650 nanometers. Who thinks it's still red? Actually, let's make it 450 nanometers, because these chairs reflect light at 450 nanometers. So the chairs continue to look like this, and Barbara's 
shirt, um, cardigan continues to look like that. Is it still red? According to our perception. It's red for me. Ooh! Okay. The problem with that is it makes red entirely objective. Um, and the thing about colours is they're not entirely objective. They're, they are essentially subjective. I think that we would continue to call... I mean, we'd be really flummoxed if we then discovered that the, the uh, wavelength had changed. Um, obviously, that's not something that's actually going to happen. But it is a possibility, isn't it? There is a possible world at which Barbara's um, cardigan is reflecting light at 250 nanometers, but it looks like that. And that may be because our visual systems are different or, or whatever. But, but the fact is, it's still red, isn't it? If it looks like that, it's still red. And it's looking like that it seems to be an essential property of it's being red. Lights, uncertain lights, certain sodium street lights or something like that. I won't see that red colour, but I know her cardigan is red. Yes, I, uh, absolutely right. We usually add um, red in normal conditions. Um, but we still haven't got to the bottom of red because... Um, we, we've all noted that, that we have a private experience, don't we? Is that what red is? Okay, so, so I have decided that this is not the right um, reply to that because it's too objective. But it's a very good one, and it's not the only It's, it's also not thing. what I said. I said red is a name that we give, not red. Ah, okay. If you try to give the name red, to a certain frequency, then red is defined by the frequency if you, if you independent give, of our perception. If you give a name to a certain frequency, but what we're asking is, what does red mean? Red, to me, means a certain frequency of light, being a physicist. And, <laughs> yeah, but, but haven't I just shown that you're wrong about that? No. no. Okay, no. well, let's, let's move on. Perhaps, okay, so uh, what is red? Is the que oh my pen's turned red? That's nice. <laughs> so we looked at um, it is the wavelength at which it reflects light. We've looked at that, and I've said no, too objective. It pays no attention whatsoever to our experience. Okay, so the second one, it is the subjective experience that we have when we look at Barbara's cardigan, or the, this ink, either way. Okay, what do we think of that one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can't say yes to that, no, you said can. yes. It's because I can differentiate between the physical wavelength of the light and my perception of the colour that that wavelength represents. As again, I go back to being colour But what I'm asking in is... In red, green, colour brightness, red and green look the same colour to me, even though they're not. OK, but what I'm asking is, what is red? Not what is your experience of red? Red is a, a, wave, a certain wavelength of light. OK, well, let, let me carry on. Let me carry on, because uh, we, we've looked at that one already. OK, so what is red? It's the subject experience that we all have when we look at Barbara's... Who, who thinks that's a good answer? Okay, a few people putting their hands up. Okay, shall I show you why that one's wrong? Um, that one's wrong because if that were the case, we could never teach anyone red, could we? We'd never know that we were, were talking about the same thing when we talked about redness. I have no idea what your experience is when you look at Barbara's cardigan. It may be something completely different from what I experience. And if you were my child and I was trying to teach you the word red, I'd look at that and say, red, red, red. And the child would go, red, 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 wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. But how do I know the child's right? I don't. Maybe the child's looking. So surely that's got to be wrong too, because it's too subjective. It doesn't take into the account the fact that we think there's something objective about redness. And that objectiveness, of course, you do talk about wavelengths and things like that. 
So, okay, if neither of those is correct, what is the correct account of what is redness? Does it say what's in common between, say, a press box and a sun apples and a cricket ball? And that's You're definitely right going in the right so direction here. That's coming down to So you can say to a child, that's red, and show them a red apple. And you show them enough things that are red, then they'll see something else that you've not defined as red, and they'll associate that. Excellent. That, that's exactly right. Um, what it is, is the commonality. It doesn't matter what our experience is. We've all been taught that that is red. So whatever we experience, whatever the, the wavelength that it's reflecting light at, that is red. So redness is... Wait for it. Is the colour? Uh, oh, hang on. Um, that normal people <laughs> under normal conditions experience when in psychophysically optimal <laughs> conditions with respect to an object. <laughs> that reflects light at 650 nanometers. <laughs> Do you see what we've done? We've brought in both the subjective and the objective and said that both of them are essential to redness. There would be no redness if there were no things on this earth that have visual systems like ours. We look at things that reflect light at 650 nanometers and we say that's red. Doesn't really matter what the experience is that we had, as Wittgenstein said, the experience itself is, is not a nothing, but it's not a something either. All that's necessary is that we all use the word in the same way. But is normal necessary? Isn't what yes, is because as that person who sees it as green, or what we would call green, just the same to that person is red. Uh, yeah, well, that's why you've got to have normal people under normal conditions. I mean, somebody colourblind doesn't satisfy this. Um, so we can't use a colourblind person to determine whether something's red. I mean, if, if what's your name? Jeff. If Jeff is colourblind, then I'm not going to ask him what colour Barbara is. distinguish the red and the blue. Yeah, because um, yeah. he, red and blue, not yeah, just red, red and blue. Well, red and green. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's why we leave Jeff out when we're talking about this. We also leave out rooms where the um, light bulbs have been covered in red tissue paper and etc, etc, etc. We've got to be in psychophysically optimal conditions with respect to the object that's reflecting light at 650 nanometers before we can say that's red, okay, um, for sure. Can we say it's uh, agreement of common interpretation? <coughs> In a way, we can with respect to redness. There's a bit more to it than that because um, we do know that um, it, it's objects that reflect light. Uh, that um, human beings tend to group things. I mean, you say that it differs from culture to culture. I think only at the boundaries. I mean, if we have a French person who says rouge and we say red, um, a French person may admit more things into red than we would, but but. I've read a lot about it, and there are big cultural differences among certain African and Polynesian people who group together what we call three or four different colours, and yet have four or five names. Who and has heard about one. Gru? Ha! Ooh. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. Can I really do Gru? <laughs> okay. Um, all emeralds are green. Would we agree with that? No. <laughs> well, if we're not going to agree with it, I'm not going to do Gru, because we're going to spend too much time. Okay, let's move on to, can we embrace both the principle of justice and the principle of equality? Okay, I've been looking so far at um, metaphysics. Um, truth is, is a question in metaphysics. Um, colour is actually a question in metaphysics and in epistemology. But let's move now to ethics and, and politics, which of course are, are both 
philosophical. Um, let me tell you a little story. Um, Wilt Chamberlain was a, a very famous basketball player. Actually, I have no idea whether he existed or not. Did he exist? Does anyone know? He's a real person. Okay. Um, but he, he's a really, really good basketball player. And he brings the crowds in. So one day he says to his team, um, I'm not going to play next time unless you give me 25 pence extra for every person who comes through the gates. Um, and they think, oh, don't like this blackmail, etc., etc. But on the other hand, if, if Wilt doesn't play, nobody will come to the game. Um, so we'll all lose out anyway. So um, they agree to this. And so obviously after the next game, Wilt earns a lot more money um, than anyone else does. So I think you'll agree that um, the principle of equality here has been, actually that should not be justice, but liberty. How annoying. Um, liberty, it may look like justice, what it says is liberty, right? <laughs> um, okay, so Walters has blown the principle of equality here. Um, but uh, he would otherwise have had to be made to play, even though he didn't want to, wasn't prepared to, or the other players, uh, I mean, he has made the other players accept that he has more money, doesn't he? And the um, philosopher Robert Nozick, who was, who's since died, but was writing, um, this is about 35 years ago, I suppose, said that um, justice and, sorry, liberty and equality will always conflict. The only way we can make sure that people are equal is by forcing some people to give up their holdings that we then give to the people who don't have as much. Okay? So what, we're either going to make Wilt do something he doesn't want to do, or we're going to make the, players, the other players do something they don't want to do, or we're going to refuse to let the people who are paying Wilt an extra 25 cents pay an extra 25 cents. They want to see Wilt, they're prepared to pay an extra 25 cents. Or we're going to have to force Wilt, after he's made his money, we're going to have to tax him in order to give. So, so Nozick was saying, and, and Jerry Cohen, who was at this university and also died um, fairly recently, uh, said that liberty and equality are in constant tension. They always conflict with each other. There's nothing you can do um, to, to bring them into alignment with each other. If you want equality, you're going to have to interfere with liberty. If you want liberty, you're going to have to interfere with equality. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's right. It's true. Oh, right. <laughs> we have a truth. Uh, I'm concerned about what you mean by equality. I think that's a dodgy word. Yes, equality is a, a very, I, I mean, there are lots of books written about what is equality. Um, because, of course, it could be, um, are we talking about a straightforward, I give you 10, you 10, you 10, you 10, and everybody else in the room 10. Well, that's, you know, uh, I dare say that this machine costs a lot of money. Shouldn't you have more than 10 if we're going to really treat you equally? Um, and, and so on. And all of us who are wearing glasses, God, they're expensive, aren't they? <laughs> you know, we should get extra um, because we have to pay for these things. So, yes, equality is, is a big word. Um, and we might want to look at um, equal, um, do we give to people uh, in accordance with how much they need? Is that to be equal treatment? Um, or is equal just giving them the same amount, or is it just allowing them to have equal opportunity, etc.? So maybe a group of libertarians might come to the decision between them that what's better for them is just you know, having an equal society to share. You know. So they're, they're coming to that decision of their own, it's not being forced on Oh, yes, there are ways of mitigating it. Well, I, well, we hope that there are ways of mitigating it, because if Cohen and Nozick are right, if, if there is an inevitable conflict between liberty and equality, then given that we all value both liberty and equality, we need to find a way of, of 
balancing these two. I mean, actually, this is the problem of modern government, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, do we let the refugees in, or do we say, oh my goodness, the NHS is on its knees, our schools are on, its, on their knees, you know, what? Um, we haven't got enough to share? Or do we say, oh, actually, you know, what's that got to do with anything? We've got to share, we're human, we're... And the, the conflict between liberty and equality is, is at the bottom of so many... Um, and if we're going to redistribute in order to achieve equality, if we're going to... So, taxation, and every... I'm lecturing here for, for an hour, let's say. Actually, I've been told I must finish before the hour. Uh, if it was an hour, they're going to take away a, roughly a quarter of that. So, I'm, in a minute, I'm going to be lecturing for nothing. Yeah, why should I do that? <laughs> well, you'll get your bins emptied <laughs> well and I'll have roads to drive on and the children that I don't have will be able to go to school and yeah. if, uh, something, if I get not knocked on my bike I'll be taken to hospital and, okay but, but maybe I'm, I mean all those things could be provided by private finance couldn't they oh. <laughs> um, I mean they could be provided charitably do, do you see what I mean here? We've got this one conflict. You can see all the ills of society in terms of this one conflict. How do we go about addressing it? How do we um, respect what's due to both liberty and equality um, when we know that actually getting consensus on an issue like this is, is really really difficult. Um, so some people tend naturally towards liberty and some people tend naturally towards equality. Very, very difficult. Okay, I'd be better move on before this Can becomes a Trump thing. I actually prefer your original word, justice, rather than liberty, because if, if bullies have total liberty, then it obviously interferes with equality. But if you have justice, then you're you're implying in that both liberty and fairness and all of those qualities of this balance in that. Well, which is why liberty should be there, not justice, because justice arises from the right balance of liberty and okay. equality. Yeah, I mean, okay. okay. Um, that was my yeah. error, so no, no, I'm sorry. Um, okay, am I gonna stop there or No <laughs> Got another one. What are the limits of possibility? Ooh, there aren't any, somebody said. That's interesting. Um, okay, so if I wanted to fly to the back of the room, can't be bothered to walk. I've done too much cycling today. I want to fly to the bottom. That's possible, is it? Got a really big drone. There's between possibility and probability, aren't uh, well, it's neither possible nor probable. <laughs> it's not probable nor possible that I'll fly to the back of the room, however much I want to do it. Um, what's stopping me? The laws of nature. Yeah, the laws of nature constrain possibility, don't they? Or do they? Might the laws of nature be different? <laughs> we've overcome laws of nature. I mean, we, we have aeroplanes. You know, we have drones, all sorts of things that do. Um, I don't think an aeroplane, I mean, I hate flying, so I'm quite prepared to believe that an uh, aeroplane is against the laws of nature. Um, but I'm told reliably that it's not. I'm told that, that everything that aeroplanes do is natural. Uh, natural is a big word. <laughs> constraints enough, and the laws of nature are a big constraint, aren't they? Um, but could they be different? Which is the question I'm... Okay, lots of people nodding their heads. We do think that, well, it might not be another planet as... Well, actually, we do know... Well, gravity is different on the moon, but that's not the laws of nature of this universe being different, is it? <laughs> that's just um, the law of gravity being applied in a different context. So if I, if I say you're wearing purple, 
if I say it today, then it's true, but if I say it tomorrow, it might be false, mightn't it? So in a different context, the facts change. So in the same way the law of gravity applied on Earth and applied on the Moon are going to generate two different um, results. Um, so going back to the question, could the laws of nature be different? Not in different planets, in other words, in this universe, because presumably this universe is governed by the same laws of nature wherever we are in the universe. But on all those other possible worlds um, that we saw that we have to admit um, otherwise, I mean, perhaps we have to admit them for physical reasons, but, but the other possible worlds that we admit for purposes of quantum mechanics are physical worlds for which there might be empirical evidence, whereas the possible worlds of logic are not physical worlds and we will never find empirical evidence where we look for arguments or logical arguments for their existence. And there, of course, the laws of nature might be different. Um, but, but not only that, uh, our knowledge of the laws of nature are still being um, discovered, aren't they? We're yes. Yes, but that's an epistemological point rather than a metaphysical point. I mean, that goes back to believing P and P. I mean, if we think of the uniformities of nature being as they are out there independently of us, and our beliefs about the uniformities of nature, or our beliefs about the laws of nature and the laws of nature themselves, then the beliefs can be false. The laws of nature can't be. The laws of nature are as they are. And what I'm asking is not whether our beliefs about the laws of nature would change if we were in different possible worlds. I'm asking whether the laws of nature might themselves change if we were in different possible worlds. Of course, if they changed, our beliefs would also change, we hope, because our beliefs go along with the evidence. But, um, Are you not simply not saying that the, the world, the, the universe we're looking at is changing in size? So at one time things are possible. As our knowledge gets bigger, we say that we have now a unified understanding, which encompasses a larger uh, world, a larger universe. So well, if we made it bigger and bigger to incorporate the whole multiverse, anything might be possible. Um, I disagree with that. Um, I think the laws of logic and the laws of physics are two different things. Um, and I think that what, um, if anything limits the possibilities, it's the laws of logic, uh, not the laws of physics. The laws of nature limit the possibilities in this universe. The laws of logic limit the possibilities in any possible world. Um, but um, might the laws of logic be different? So we believe, for example, that, that either P or not P, that's a law of logic, either P or not P, it cannot be the case. There's nothing, there's no third truth value and there's no truth value gap. <coughs> it's either P or not P. What about or is it? Well, um, quantum entanglement is one of the things that might cause us to think that that's not true, that actually uh, it, there is a third possibility. And another one, here's a very simple one, well, it's not not red. I mean, if, if it's not not red doesn't mean it's red, then the law of double negation falls out, doesn't it? Because double negation tells us that if it's not not P, then it's P. At least it does if, it, if you go for classical logic. But perhaps we should scrap classical logic. Perhaps we should go <coughs> in for intuitionistic logic. Uh, or perhaps we should, we should um, go in for paraconsistent logics. We tend to think that once we meet, meet a contradiction, a case of P and not P, We've, we've got to stop. We've got evidence for error. There's P and there's not P. That's not a possible situation. Not in any possible world if you've got P and not P. But if you um, embrace paraconsistent logic, you don't think of a contradiction as, as necessarily evidence for error. There are some contradictions that are evidence for something else. I don't quite know what. I mean, paraconsistent logic isn't my field. What about uncertainty? Well, uncertainty is an epistemological um, 
I mean, so, so a law might be perfectly determinate, but, but because we don't know enough about it, all we can predict is probabilities rather than... So we're uncertain about how the law pans out in every possible situation. But it doesn't mean the law itself is a statistical law. It might still be a deterministic law, and we're just uncertain about it. I'm not convincing you. I can see that. Well, why not? Um, well, things like Heisenberg, you know, and, and things can... That's a, that's a di different situation. I mean, when we're looking at... Quantum mechanics is very, very different. If anything forces us into changing the law, thinking that the laws of logic are wrong, it's quantum mechanics. And there's a big debate about whether um, quantum entanglement should... I look at, I look at you because you're a physicist, and I'm expecting you to say, what rubbish do we put in? Um, uh, a big debate, does it force us to reject the law of excluded middle uh, and the law of double negation? Uh, or can we hold on to that and, and just interpret um, Schrodinger's cats differently? I mean, instead of saying that it's um, the cat is dead and alive, which is what physicists tell me we've got to say, um, we, sh we can say what we want to say, which is the cat is dead or alive. Um, do you say that, I mean, for little words, or and and are so powerful, aren't they? Of course it should be or, but apparently it's not, it's and. And that's really interesting. If, that, if that's true, that forces us to change the laws of logic. And that's what philosophy is all about, folks. Um, so I'm just going to... Um, a couple of things. Okay, there's a series of podcasts here on logic uh, by me, um, six of them. They've been uh, global number one on iTunes U for about 10 years now, going in and out. Um, there's a book to go with them. There's a short online course to go with both. Um, if anyone wants these, they only have to email me. Um, and to, you can get my address online very easily. Um, where to go from here? Uh, well, OK, if you have a look at the OUDC website, you'll see that there are weekly classes on philosophy. There are weekend <coughs> schools on philosophy. There are summer schools. There are online courses. There are 10 short online courses. Um, there's the Certificate of Higher Education, which you can specialise in philosophy. Um, there's the OUDC Philosophical Society, which has 350 members. It's all over the world. It's hugely active. Um, there's Oxford University Philosophy Podcasts there. Um, that's my website. That's my Twitter feed. That's my Facebook page. So come and join me. And thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch, everyone.